into Philippians 2, I'm going to read something that, uh, that uh, Doug Fisher gave to me many, many years ago, <clears throat> and it's just a poem, <clears throat> but he had it framed and everything. You know, the problem I have with this is he gave me this many, many years ago, and it's about an old man. Anyway, um, <clears throat> says an old man going along his way came at evening, old and gray, to a chasm or chasm, vast and deep and wide, which he must cross without chart or guide. Over he crossed in the twilight dim. The sullen stream had no fears for him. But he paused when safe on the other side and builded a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a fellow pilgrim near, your journey ends at the close of day and never again will you come this way. You've crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build this bridge at eventide? The traveler raised his old gray head. Good friend, in the path I've come, he said, there followeth after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm has been of naught to me, but to that fair youth may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building the bridge for him. Doug signed it, your friend forever, Doug. <clears throat> That's it. You know, we're not working for ourselves. We're not doing this for ourselves. This isn't really even about us. It's about the Lord and it's about others. And that's the spirit of Christ. And that's what we live for and that's what we live by and that's who we are. It's not even what we believe. It's not our belief system. It's who we are because that's the way Jesus is in us. <clears throat> and uh, so, so we're going to be faithful. We're going to be faithful to the Lord. We're going to be faithful to the younger ones coming along. And we're going to give our time and our energy and our effort and our money and everything that we've got to help those along the way. And uh, what a blessing and privilege it is to be able to do that, isn't it? What a blessing and privilege. <clears throat> All right, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2 if you haven't already. <clears throat> and... Um, just a, a point to make in relationship, and, and I have a few of the, the high points in my notes, but as a scripture searcher, as a Bible searcher, and we're all that, young or old, it is real important to pay attention <clears throat> to the area that the, uh, of which you're searching, not just the context, but the emphasis of that area. And here's what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Philippians 2 is about the cross. And yet, um, so is um, Romans 6, and so is Colossians Two, and so is, you know, on and on and on and on. <clears throat> and what we, what we tend to do or could possibly do is we would learn about the cross, about Jesus' death, about, um, about uh, forgiveness of sin, all the things that relate to the cross as understood by hopefully every believer. And therefore, every time the scriptures talk about the cross, we would read into that section of scriptures that that's what it's talking about. <clears throat> now, Philippians is an incredible example of that because here it's really, I mean, just offhand, I can't think of anywhere else in the whole New Testament where it is giving the specific emphasis of the cross that doesn't have to do with sin, that doesn't have to do with this, doesn't have to do with that, it's not covering this, not covering that. <clears throat> it 
but has a real emphasis of meaning. And if we, if we just see the word cross and we read a few things about it, you know, uh, um, that he, you know, uh, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, and just assume that that's relating to, shall I say, what we know, this gonna, it's going to be a slow advance in, in the knowledge of the Lord and in the reality of the Lord. <clears throat> um, another example that I think of that I was, was uh, shall I say, confrontational to me was Romans 6, where um, I, had, I had started out when I got saved with Kenneth Copeland Ministries before he was famous and worldwide. He just was an evangelist for a little church in Fort Worth. And, and I was there on his, um, his uh, intercessory prayer team. And, um, and so I learned a particular emphasis of the cross, and I also, but I also learned a particular emphasis. And a lot of that emphasis had to do with that the problems that Christians are having are really with the devil. Okay, the devil. Well, okay, well, I agree with that. You know, the devil gives us problems and what have you. But I was reading Romans 6, and Romans 6 is all about the cross. And Romans 6 really gets into dealing with sin and helping Christians and all that kind of stuff. And you, you read through that chapter, and you realize it never mentions the devil once. I mean, I'm telling you where I was coming from. I, I was shocked. It's like, you know, how could... How can you say we're having problems and the cross is the answer without mentioning the devil? Because he's the bad guy and he's the one that's given. You, you kind of understand. I know all of you didn't come from that particular emphasis. But it was a big deal to me because, you know, I mean, shall I, shall I put it this way? <clears throat> we blame the devil for everything. <laughs> okay. And Romans 6 talks about the cross, but it talks about the cross not in relationship to the devil. And that was where I first began to ask the question, you know, Lord, why didn't you crucify the devil? Why did you crucify us? You know, I mean, I was young then, so I didn't say it quite like that. I, I did. I said, why are you, you know, why don't you crucify the devil? Why are you crucifying us? He's the problem, you know, in a sort of immature way of, you know, well, the first thing you have to realize, number one, is that God understands well beyond what we understand, and he's our father, and there are some things that we'll grow into. The other one thing to understand is that the scriptures, the New Testament scriptures, are full of so many, many examples of the cross at work in, in all sorts of areas. And by the way, I looked for that picture and I haven't been able to find it. I don't know, I hope I find it, but somebody probably has it. <clears throat> anyway, I did a chalkboard thing. Some of you remember Lindsay helped me and we wrote all the examples of the cross with death or the world or the you know, flesh or the, you know, becoming the, his bride. And we filled this board up with, with examples of the cross. <clears throat> and, um, and showed that the cross is not one dimensional. And I would venture to say to all of you that there is a good chance that there are aspects of the cross that you haven't even discovered yet. And, and I, well, of course you would, but I believe that's true for me. And I'm excited about it. <laughs> you know, I want to know the, the full counsel of God. I want to know the Lord in his fullness. And I want to know that cross because the cross is, is the answer. And when I was in Belgium just a couple of weeks ago, I, I took my second session and I really started just going down the line of the, some of the different things to awaken them to the cross being more than something that's talked about on Easter or the simple salvation. Well... Romans 6 does that, and it talks, but it talks about the cross for us in relationship to the old nature. And that, <clears throat> that yes, Jesus was crucified, but the old man was put to death with Christ. All right. 
So after I digested the reality that uh, if there was no devil, I mean, after the fall, if there was no devil, there would still be a problem. And I would see it every morning in the mirror. You know, that there still is that problem. <clears throat> but there's an answer, and the answer is Christ. But the, the, the door, the door to the fullness of Christ is through the cross. And there is no other door and <clears throat> that becomes your motivation that becomes your motivation but jesus is your motivation you'll go through that door if you want jesus bad enough you'll take up the cross you'll whatever whatever the cross says to you um it's kind of like you know the 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 pic sorry the picture that we've drawn many times you know that we were in adam over here and then there's the cross, and then there's Christ. And to get, to, get, to get there, you have to pass through that door. But in reality, there is a gazing upon the Lord, if you will, and you can draw that any number of ways, but I'm going to draw this arrow from the old to the new, which is Christ, as you gaze upon him, and a gaze is more than just a quick look. It is to take him in, to behold Amen. the Lamb of God, not just look at him. Yep, that's him. You know. <clears throat> but as you take him in, as you take the Lord in in this, in this way, there's a drawing. There's a drawing. But he says, if I be lifted up from this earth, and he's talking about this, this spoke of the death, that he should die. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. What? Where? Whoa, whoa, whoa. You, he draws you to Christ crucified. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Do you agree with that? Is that what the scriptures are saying? And, and if it is, <clears throat> then you realize that when Paul said, we preach Christ crucified, he didn't say we preach Christ and the cross or we preach Christ and crucifixion. Or, do you understand what I'm saying? They weren't two things to him. They were one reality. All right. <clears throat> that, that introduces us into Philippians then because Philippians 2 is not about sin and it's not about problems uh, as far as, you know, um, <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's dealing with the cross, and maybe I should just read, um, where are we, 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. All right. There's uh, the cross is being presented here, but not in the realm of sin. We're dealing with sin. There's no mention of sin in there. I mean, there's no, you know, uh, there's no theology of the fall here or redemption. And I don't think that that's necessarily obvious unless a person approaches every time you come to an area in the scriptures that talk about the cross, that you take it seriously that this could be a gold mine of reality that only God can truly show you. So, you know, it's the, these scriptures are not talking about salvation or heaven or hell or Easter or you know, any, any of that stuff. But it, is, it does have its meaning. And, and there's, the thing is, there's no mention of benefits to us here. There's not even a mention of this cross taking place for us on any level. Now, now let's, let's consider just quickly some of the other aspects of the cross. Well, you know, Paul said, uh, I am crucified unto the world, and the world is crucified unto me. Well, that only took place at the cross. So that's the cross for us, particularly in relationship to the world. 
It's not just some general truth that you believe and it magically happens. There is a reality when it comes to dealing with the world that we need to know the cross in that realm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not just the same cross that we know over in this realm. There needs to be an expanded view of specifically how God is applying that. Well, you go right on down. The old man and sins and sin and, you know, on and on and on. <clears throat> there are all these different aspects. But this one, this one doesn't mention any benefit or any work that he's doing on us. It is simply the cross that he has chosen for his reasons. Okay. Now, that's really, really important. It's really, really important. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I was, uh, you'd think I'd, I'd have enough of Galatians 2.20 by now, wouldn't you? But I was meditating on it uh, just the other day. And I'm, I don't want to spell this out, but the Holy Spirit will probably show you. But I felt like the Spirit of God landed on me when I read it again this time. And, it, and, and Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. And we always say that. Paul said, I... And the thought and the words came to me. Saul of Tarsus didn't say those words. Paul said those words. Now maybe you don't see the vast, but there's a huge, Saul of Tarsus, you say, well, it's the same person. No, it's not the same person, actually, but if, if Saul of Tarsus said something about the cross, it would be, he died for me. Isn't that right? But after being saved, Paul chose the cross that's that's mind-blowing i mean that's just i mean if you hear that and let's just say if if it's spirit breathe all of a sudden you realize that there's a cross for us that is a free will offering not not we need that to to get free from the world or we need that to get free from sin or we need that to get you know you know all that junk all the, i just want to get rid of my junk so i embrace the cross well you know trust me once all the junk's gone you're gone but in reality you still have your personality you still have your choice of what you want to embrace and here in these scriptures, he's trying to present that reality. And in Galatians 2.20 also, but I think even more so here. He's saying, you know, he's saying, Saul didn't make this decision. Paul's making this decision. And, and my old life and my old me isn't making this decision to follow the cross and to to embrace it in the way that we see it in the scriptures. That's me. I, I'm making that. You know, Jesus did that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but thine be done. <clears throat> okay, well, there's another mind blower that I, years ago when I, I saw that. I, you know, I mean, we, we quote that a lot. You know, not my will, but thine be done. But I'm going, what do you mean not your will? You're the son of God. Your will is the same as God's. Right? I mean, on that front, he's, it's exactly the same, you know. Not my will, but his. Well, his is mine, so no big deal. I ain't giving up much. You see? You got to walk down this path and look at all the aspects of it. Well, yes, J Jesus said that as a man, not my will, but thine be done. But there's another aspect of that, too, and that is this aspect that says... Even, get ready, even if my choice or my will is exactly what God's is, I don't want to go with my will. I want to do this because it's his will. It's, it's a, you say, well, you're just splitting hairs because you're going to end up doing the same thing. I'm saying, I'm not splitting hairs. I'm choosing Jesus over me. 
I want the Lord. I want it to be Christ in me, and I want every decision and every part that I make. Uh, because, you know, I'll tell you why I want that, because I'm so spiritual. No, because if I don't do that, if I make the decision, even though it was his, that's what he wanted to do also, I'll end up glorying in it. I know you won't, but I will. <laughs> you know, I'll end up finding some way to take some credit for it. But I don't want to do that. I don't even want to, see, I don't even want to open that door because I know, you know, this monster that is me will push the door open, you know. So I don't even want to open the door to, to, to anything of me. So many times when I know, you know, um, you know, I'll be praying about something and then I'll, you know, I'll find out what the will of God is. I will literally say in my mind, I am doing this, whether I'm saying it to me, the devil, or whatever. I sometimes say it out loud. I am doing this because this is God's will, not because I am even choosing God's will. Now, I am, but I'm just taking the me out of it. You know, I'm just, I just don't want any of that uh, muddy in the water, and it's worse than that, you know. <laughs> But I don't want any of that. I want the Lord to get all the glory. All the glory. And the only way he's going to get all the glory is when we can't glory in anything but the Lord. He that glorieth, let him. Let him. That's a, that's, that's a yielding thing. It's not a, you know, doing it so I yield up my will even though it's the same as his. And, and yeah, Ben. Yeah, well said. <clears throat> you know, nobody can form our heart in this way except the Holy Spirit. I mean, I want you to know that. I, I want you to know that if you have any desires in this direction, <laughs> that it's not just you. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, and he's on you to do that. And the Bible says that he works in you both to will and to do. Okay, that you can trust that, okay? Maybe, notice the wording. It says he works in you both to will and to do. So willing comes first. What does that mean? What are we talking about here? It means that he will bring your will where you want to say yes to the, I want this to be the Lord or I want it to be the, on those fronts. And it may be first and it may be for a while, but he will bring the the doing, the ability to do by God who is at, at work in you. That's what those scriptures say. It's, it's right here in Philippians. <clears throat> it is God at work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. All right. So now if it, just imagine if all Christians believed that. Just, just imagine. If they all believed that, there wouldn't be anybody glorying that they chose the mission field or that they did this or they, well, I'm, I'm, and you're not. You know what I mean? And then look down your nose at somebody, which is the exact opposite of what Philippians is trying to, the spirit he's trying to put within us. Jesus made himself a servant and became a man and then went lower from there and lower simply, simply to raise us up and yet, <clears throat> and yet it's not even mentioning that because it's trying to communicate something on a, on a deeper level, you know. So Philippians is not talking about the theology of how to embrace the theology. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, that, don't, anybody, anybody worry or fret over trying to embrace certain areas of truth uh, because you want that, but you're, you're, you, so you study the theology of how to embrace the theology. <laughs> that's a, that's like a hamster on one of those little wheels. You're just, you know, you're just, you're not going to get anywhere with that. Okay, when the heart turns to the Lord, then the veil is rent, and then you see Him for, as He is. <clears throat> so, um, and. <clears throat> And so in light of, you know, that, then you're not really searching the scriptures for more truth to get deeper or to know the mysteries. You want the Lord. You want the Lord. And, you, you know, you can take, uh, you know, it's like Israel. Uh, when they left Egypt, it was an 11-day journey from Egypt to the promised land. 11 days. How long did it take them? 40 years. You know, you can take that long if you want. You know, it's up to you. However, <clears throat> however, you don't have to spend 20 or 30 or 40 years trying to lay hold of deep knowledge and mysteries and figure stuff out and get, in, you know, like I said, get the theology of how to embrace the theology and do all of that, you can just say, I want you, Lord. And every time you pray, and every time you're in class, and every time uh, I was telling somebody the other day that <clears throat> a regular thing I do now is, you know, <clears throat> uh, before I tell you what it is, in my early going, when I went to Bible school, <clears throat> um, I, went, I went through some struggles uh, dealing with Bible school and whatever. <clears throat> And one of my struggles was that in the particular Bible school I went to, they had some people that really, really knew the Lord, and they had some people that really didn't even know how to teach their way out of a barrel, you know what I mean? I mean, no, it was, it was bad. You think I'm bad. You, these guys, you know. I mean, it was just like, and, and they didn't even know the scriptures as well as some of the students did. And I was just sitting there going, good. You know, but it was required, and I had to have that class. You know what I mean? I had to be in that class. And I just went, oh, God, I hate this, you know? You know, I hate it when Scott teaches on Sunday. Or, you know, <laughs> just kidding, brother. <clears throat> and, and just going through, you know, I mean, I was, I was just like, I, and here's, I want Jesus so much. Why did I have to sit through this class, you know? And the, the, the blessing of it is, is that I had me a tape recorder and I would put it in the classes that I really wanted to enjoy. So, and I'd ask them to start and stop it. And when I graduated, I ended up on the mission field and I was so glad I had all those tapes, you know what I mean? But, but before I'd graduate, way before, I had to get this thing dealt with about, you know, and the, the way that I dealt with it was <clears throat> that in my mind and in my heart, Anytime I, had, anytime I had a class or church or anything else, I would sit down in a, in a desk, you know, the kind that had the little thing around where you can write, you know, a regular school type desk. I would sit down at that desk and the Holy Spirit would be my teacher. And, he, and, I, and I would trust him to teach me, even if the person wasn't saying, you know, anything or it wasn't even in the area that I needed. You know what that's like, you know. Have you ever had somebody prophesy and say, well, God's going to help you with your dad. And you're going, he died 20 years ago. You know what I mean? <laughs> or, or something, you know. <clears throat> and and um, so I, I learned in all of those situations that my teacher was the Holy Spirit, and he would show me incredible things. I mean, if anybody, even, even if they can't teach anything or know anything, usually they'll quote a scripture. And the Holy Spirit will just go, wow. You know what I mean? And he'll just take off. So I, I learned to do that. <clears throat> but that's served me well for years. <clears throat> but even recently, the Lord, the Father, the Lord, the Holy Spirit have been more precious than I can put into words and have sat down with me and 
not open the word, yes, yeah, but open their heart and, and open things that I don't believe they just open to anybody unless they're really, you know, I, I don't know how to word that, so I'm just going to leave that. But, and, and when I get through now, you know, I just close up my Bible and I just say thank you. Father, for opening your heart and opening the things that you care about and, 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 and letting me commune with you over the things that are important to you. And I just want you to know that this is such a high blessing for me that you would even allow someone like me to be able to do that. And I... I I do it every time now. But before, I used to go, you know, it's like, okay, lesson's over. Close my books. You understand kind of the way I'm saying it? I would say, well, lesson over. Thank you. I've got some great notes here. Are you following what I'm saying here? You know, I got, thank you, you know, and got some great notes. And the teacher there in front of my desk taught me well and that I didn't get up and, and, and in a certain way, not even look back, you know. Uh, in fact, look forward to the next time when I got some good stuff. And it's just different now. It's just different. I just, um, I'm just so broken up uh, when he gets through because I know, you know, I know that this is bigger to him than I even understand. <clears throat> well, the Spirit of God and the Father want to show us Christ. And they want him revealed in us. And they want our minds and our hearts and, and every aspect of it. And it's not going to happen if we get sidetracked on theology and searching the scriptures for more truth and trying to figure out the mysteries and all of this stuff. If, um, and th there's a thought that can arise in your head when you're in Bible school or when you're learning, and that is, well, look, you know, and, and, you know, everybody else is going faster than me. Anybody ever had a thought sort of like that, you know? Everybody else is going faster than me, and, they're, and I'm, I'm just lagging behind and everything. Well, you know what? Just stay with what the Lord's showing you. Don't worry about everyone else. The truth is, if you get that little bit that he's sharing with you in you, it'll last you a lifetime. It'll last you a lifetime. <clears throat> I was thinking about seeing seeing the Lord as opposed to remembering the Lord. And I, and I thought, you know, the scriptures really say a lot about remember when da-da-da-da. I mean, you, you should go through it. You'll be amazed how many times he tells you to remember certain things. And seeing the Lord a lot of times can just be an event where we've seen something and then, and, and it's kind of like we, we uh, it's kind of like a meal that we eat too fast, <laughs> you know, we, it, it's gone. Yeah. Leonard, yes. That's right. Basically, the Bible says confess your faults one to another, so pretty much everything I share is telling you about my faults. But I mean, when I got into Bible school, I had a voracious appetite. I wanted to eat everything, every book. I went down to the library and got every book that I could on deeper life, and I went down to their audio library, and I, I, I took a bunch of my tapes of other, other teachings, set it down, said, fill it with everything you got on the cross. And they had a little thing like it was like a, all the stuff was back here, and they had like a bar there. I felt like I was walking in a bar and going, look, <laughs> fill it up, you know. <laughs> so give me everything you got on the cross. <clears throat> and um, 
I mean, I'm listening and I'm, you know, all this kind of stuff. But I felt like, you know, and I, you know, I'm sorry to put it this way, but I felt like I was just eating this going right through my body and out into the toilet. And there was no remembrance. And in fact, in fact, what would blow my mind is maybe six months or a year or two years later, that same truth would come up and it would be like brand new to me. And I didn't, I, 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 but, and I couldn't believe that I had been shown that, but it was in my own handwriting. I had written it down. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> and you're going, geez, I let that whole thing get past me, you know? <laughs> and I don't want to do that. I, you know, I don't want to do that. And, and, you know, I don't know. I guess sometimes we, we roll this way in class, but that's the way we seem to be rolling. But I, I'll be honest with you. <clears throat> I didn't give hardly any time to this class. I haven't done my newsletter for this month. All I seem to be doing is sitting in the presence of the Lord and just fellowshipping and communing. And, and it's just, it's more wonderful than I can tell you. It is heavenly and it's glorious. And, you know, you talk about breakthroughs, you know. I mean, honestly, you talk about breakthroughs, oh man, yeah. This, this is breakthrough stuff, but it's not information, and it's not fixing anything per se. It's just the best kind of gift that you could have, and it just keeps rolling. And, and uh, so I'm just I'm putting it down, I'm taking the time, and then I'll go a little further, and then, you know, and I, I just don't want to miss the Lord. I don't want to do that anymore, and I don't want to be fast on the draw. I, I want to be slow. You know what I mean? Remember the story of the tortoise and the hare? You know, <laughs> that's right. Now, I just want to take it in, and I want it to be real, and I want Jesus, and I don't want to talk about Jesus if, unless it is Jesus, unless, unless something's happened in me, then I want to talk about it. If it's not, then you don't need to hear it, especially from me, you know. So anyway, these are things of the heart. <clears throat> you know, they are. They're things of the heart, and... Uh, um, uh, this, you know, this scripture, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, that's talking about the very same thing we're talking about right here. There is something that is of and in Christ that he wants in you. Do you see that? And it's, and it's not, um, it's not uh, being a better Christian. It's something of Christ. It's his mind or his attitudes or his way or his view or, you know, but, but, but him, his eyes, if you will. You know, not just his view, his eyes. You know, like, the, like somebody complimented the guy and he, he said, yeah, I got my father's eyes. And he goes, really? He says, uh, yeah, I do. He says, yeah, you do? And he says, yeah, no, no, I got him right here. <laughs> You don't want just to be able to see. You want, sorry, you want your father's eyes. And what is the result of that? You will see correctly. But if you don't have your father's eyes, then it's hit or miss, it's illumination, it's inspiration, but never the, the unveiling of Christ, which is a... Which is a huge difference, you know, from manifestation or illumination or all of those different aspects. <clears throat> Let this mind be in you. There is a yielding that goes with that word let. Let it, let it, not, not go after it and fight for it and, you know, and, you know, make it happen. The truth is you can't make it happen. Let it be in you. It's a yielding to the spirit, and it's a yielding to a reality. But if you don't know what his mind is, and, and, and folks, the rest of the verses here, all the way down to verse 8, are a description of what he's talking about he wants in you. So I'm going to put it like this. Let kenosis be in you. You don't hear that very often. Everybody talks about kenosis only in relationship to Christ. But that's what these verses are talking about, the kenosis of Christ. Are they not? 
That's what, it, that's what they're talking about. And he's saying, let kenosis be in you. Okay. But he's not saying let these activities of, you know, becoming a servant and then da-da-da-da. He's not saying that. He's saying let this spirit be in you and it will take you to get lower so that others can be pushed higher. And you'll be pleased with that. The flesh is not. Self won't be pleased with getting lower to push other people higher. It won't like it. You know why? Because I don't know. Has anybody ever helped somebody? I was, you know, I was a boy, so I had uh, three brothers. You know, and uh, anybody ever helped one of your brothers or somebody over a fence? You know, that's really tall. It'd get up and you know, here, let me. This, this is my older brother Dennis. Now he's telling me to get on bottom. He says, "Here, let me get on your shoulders." So it's get down. He stands on my shoulders, and I'm going. Oh, you know, and I'm lifting him up, you know, and he goes, I still can't reach the thing, so grab my foot and start pushing. So I'm, da -da -da -da, and his foot slipping, like sticking in my face and all this kind of stuff. And Well, in truth, if you're going to get low to help someone o over, it, isn't that really what this was talking about that we read at the beginning? If you're going to do that, people are going to step on you. And, and we're, we're going to have a hard time with it, number one, because we don't like being stepped on. And number two, we're going to question whether that person was worthy of being, being, well, being put in a position of getting higher. <laughs> you know, you're not worthy of this. You're, you're, you know, you're just going to abuse it, or you are abusing it, or you're taking advantage, you know, instead of being thankful for my help, you're taking advantage of me. Okay. <clears throat> well, see, that's not the mind of Christ. I'm just telling you. I'm not, you know, I'm just telling you that's not the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ says getting low and pushing others. You don't name them and figure them out and label them and dissect them and see if they're worthy or not. You're not a fruit inspector. You know, you're a son of God by Christ. And you do that because it's Christ in you. You don't, you're not trying to figure out their condition and if they're worthy or not. They may not be. Nobody was worthy when Jesus got low and went to the cross. No one. And isn't that what he's talking about here, the cross? And, you know, and what he did, and there's no mention of him going, well, that's okay, I'll do this for those ungrateful, you know, sorry, I'm, do, I'm doing my Nixon thing here. That was ungrateful people. <laughs> I'm not a crook. <laughs> uh, you know, and that's what we would do. We would, we would you know, we get all wrapped up in the who of it and who's, you know, well, I'll do it, but, you know, they're going to have to be better than me. Well, there's nobody better than you. <laughs> so, I mean, there's no, okay, you know, argument's over. Either you just don't do it or you find another mindset which that's what that's what let this mindset be in you that's really what it's talking about and so you you do it you know uh just just real quick but those of you who were here when dan folger was here and i'm just using dan i could use samantha i could use quite a few people that were here that were <clears throat> that just drove some of the people you know kevin whatever that drove people crazy here drove people crazy. I mean, and they would just come unglued. I don't mean upset. I mean unglued. We got to do something, you know. <laughs> she, she, she says that as she looks forward at, at Kelly. <laughs> you have the same birthday. You're out of the same womb, sister. So that <laughs> But, you know, it would just like, you know, they, we, why do we put up with these people? You have no clue how much Jesus puts up with you. You know what I mean? I mean, that's the truth. You have no clue. I was thinking about that today because 
we, we say, okay, well, when I am weak, then he is strong. But when I am strong, you know, I don't know. I, I don't, but in truth, you, when you're strong, are really yucky. You're nothing compared to the glory and beauty of Christ. Okay? And, the, and let me just, you know, make sure you understand this. It's really not about how yucky you are. It's about how beautiful he is. Okay? That's, if, you, if you just focus on how yucky you are, then you're going to get depressed, and then you're going to either kill somebody or go kill yourself or something. You know what I mean? You can, you can take it to that extreme. It's not about you. It's not about you yucky. Okay, well, guess what? Many times we're willing to receive that. It's not about me or how yucky I am. It becomes about them, the guy we're helping over there, <laughs> and how yucky they are, you know. But, hey, I got grace. They don't, you know. No, no. Jesus views us all the same because he views us in Christ, not measuring ourselves by ourselves. Paul said we don't do that. You don't measure yourself by yourself. Everything is measured by Christ. He is the measure of the stature of the fullness, which is Christ. And so, so we get our eyes off of ourselves, and we get our eyes on Jesus. And, A and D, we get our eyes off of others. And we get our eyes, we get our mind's eye in accord with the mind of Christ. With the mind of Christ. And we die, I'm just, gonna, I'm just wording it this way so you can follow. We die for the ungodly. And it, and it doesn't sound fun. And it doesn't, but you know, it's not fun. The truth is, <clears throat> the truth is that there is a fellowship in sufferings that can be had with the Lord. But it's a suffering that he suffers gladly for others. You know, I mean, you know, can you imagine, you know, Peter walking up to Jesus when he's sweating great drops of blood in Gethsemane and saying, hey, man, if you, if you need a way out of here, I know a back way out of the garden, and we can get you out of this situation. And Jesus is in agony. I mean, it says... Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. But he, he said, not my will, but thine be done. He said, you know, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He says, this is what I've come for. This right here, this very yucky, terrible stuff. This is why I'm here. <laughs> I mean, that's beautiful. That is so Jesus. It's so Jesus. And, and it's not going to be true in us unless it is so Jesus. It won't. We will always wrestle with it. We will always have a hard time with it. We will, because you, this mind is not like our mind. And this mind transforms us to be not only willing, you know. I mean, and willing is good because it, it had to be a willing sacrifice. Amen? A willing sacrifice. Well, Christ is a willing sacrifice. But he came for that. It was his joy, as it were, to give himself for others. And it's still his joy. Let this mind be in you. Okay. So, so let me just say this then. So there's no point in trying to teach this into somebody. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, you say, well, why are you doing it then? Well, I'm not. I'm, I, <laughs> well, I'm not. I believe, how shall they hear without a preacher? But hearing is not seeing. Only God can open your eyes. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, his hope in your calling you, what he, what he hopes to get out of calling you. <laughs> you know. Um, how, but how shall they hear without a preacher? Seeds have to be planted. And if the seeds get into good ground, and another waters that, 
God can bring forth the increase. But if not, if not, then we will, we will leave Egypt, but we may, may never live in the promised land. I don't, I'm, just, I'm just trying to use that as an example. Um, in reality, we are in the promised land. We're in Christ. We just need to let Christ be in us. You know, we're in Christ. And we're secure. I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, <clears throat> but we're not talking about fears of not being saved. We're talking about not wanting to miss the fullness of Christ, but wanting, you know, as John said, more of Jesus, less of me. Wanting that. <clears throat> All right, so, so there is, there is a way that this can happen in us. But it's a work of the Spirit. And it's a work of the, it's, it's a work of the Spirit when we are yielded, let, yielded. If we're, you know, I mean, it'd be weird to have a potter and clay fighting back, you know what I mean? You know, God, hey, look, I want you to look like this. I want to look like this. Hello? You know, I, I've already got it figured out what I want to look like, you know. Many of you have heard my story, but when I was in Bible school, I, you know, I wanted to be a great evangelist. Well, I already hooked up with a man who ended up being really wealthy and da 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 da. But I'm in a Bible school that teaches the cross and emphasizes world missions. <laughs> And it's like, hmm, I just won't tell them. Really? Really? I thought that. I thought that. I thought, I thought well, you know, the cross is their thing because they're going to be missionaries. They're going to need it. Well, I thought that. I'm just telling you. And I thought, I'm going to be a famous evangelist with people, I didn't go this far, but people loving me and wanting to hear me and coming by the thousands and I'll have, I'll have so much money I won't know what to do with it. Anybody see why God led me there? That's why. Because I was so off from his heart and from the true spirit of what he was wanting to work in all of us. <clears throat> well, guess what? When I graduated, I ended up going to the mission field <laughs> and was glad for it. Miss, I miss, I miss it, miss that particular place and those people. But God allows me to go to a lot of mission fields now, and I really love that too. And I love the people everywhere I go. I still miss going to Cuba. I believe the Lord's going to reopen that thing. Um, <clears throat> so, so when it says, "Let this mind be in you." You already received Christ at salvation. Am I right or wrong? But it's telling you to let something be in you. So it couldn't possibly be talking about salvation. You following? So what that does is it prepares us. It molds us. It begins to uh, uh, cause us to yield when we hear the word correctly and not according to religious thought or whatever. We hear it according to his mind. Then... We, it, it makes us open and yielded and pliable to say, you know, you know what, this is you. I mean, I, all those little resistances I told you when I was in Bible school, <clears throat> there's only one thing broke that down. I got in the Word, and God started showing me for myself. Some of these things that were being said, that's the truth. That's God's heart, not that place I was at or this place that you're at. But you have to find that as his heart. And you have to embrace that. If it's true, then you have to. Well, I saw the truth of it, and the more I saw the truth of it, I went from, oh, I want to be a great evangelist, to slowly dropping the old arms and just going, you know, you know Lord, whatever you want. You know, I just want to be with you. And when it's all said and done, you know, I don't want to be famous. I just want to make sure I'm with you from start to finish. That was the way my mentality was at that time. You know, it's like I want to get off track somewhere along the line, you know, 
uh, I, the one thing I want is to stay with you in, until I die. Well, obviously, it's, it's grown beyond that now. <clears throat> so by saying, let this mind be in you, there's something else of Christ, not just something else of truth, meaning there's something else. Oh, you know, the Holy Spirit or the gifts or... Sure, all that. That's not what he's addressing here. Most Christians need to awaken to the fact there's, that there's something else, something more of Christ for Christians. Make sense? That there's something more of Christ for Christians. And that's, you know, in all my travel, for example, in uh, this last trip in Belgium, they have a room full of people that are just so, so hungry as they're listening and going, oh my God. God, there's more of Jesus. It made them happy. It was like, there's more of Jesus. It's not just some other guy coming here telling us about some other subject of Christian religion subject. They're saying there's more of Jesus, and we really love Jesus, and this is really cool. And they were just like, in fact, uh, Paul, the guy who, who has sort of been sharing along these lines with him, he, he said uh, afterwards, he said, oh, man, they're really getting it. And I said, well, how do you? You know, how do you know? I mean, you could obviously look at their faces and stuff, but I would say, um, I would say, was, you know, like Galatians 2.20, well, I'm crucified with Christ. Is that what it says? And they'd go, amen. And he said, I've, I've been in church with these people all their lives. I've never heard any of them ever say amen. <laughs> and he said, I mean, man, they were going, amen. I mean, it's just this full-blown witness in, in the whole place and a true, genuine hunger for more of Christ. Can you go wrong with that, folks? You can't go wrong with Jesus. You can't go wrong with Jesus. All right. All right, I think we're going to stop because uh, it's right now it's exactly 8 o'clock because the second hand just hit the 12, so we'll take a break and come back in a few minutes. <laughs>